Hello and welcome into the KE Report. I'm your host, Shad Markwitz, and today we're getting an update on Kootenai Silver. Kootenai Silver is traded on the TSXV under the ticker KTN and on the OTCQX under the ticker KOOYF. And I'm joined today with the president and CEO of Kootenai Silver, Jim McDonald. And Jim, it's great to get you back on the show, especially when it's on the back of a key milestone for the company. You put out the news to the market just yesterday on June 17th that you've put out the maiden resource estimate at the Columba project. This is in Mexico. All of the projects that you have are in Mexico. This is in the Chihuahua state. It came out to 54 million ounces of silver at an average grade of 284 grams per ton silver. And it really just showcases the high grade potential at the Columba project. So this is a banger of a first maiden resource estimate here, Jim. And I want to dive into some of the metrics here with you. But let's start off with the first and most obvious point that while you put out 54.1 million ounces of silver in this, you do still have lead and zinc, and those are not factored into the silver. That's just straight silver in that headline number, correct? Yeah, that's right. That's silver only. We didn't do an equivalency here, and that's a pure silver. Well, and if you were to include the lead and the zinc, what do you think that would do to the overall numbers? Well, it would increase it on a silver equivalent, but right now the zones we're in, as you can see, I think it's less than 1% combined lead zinc. So you might add 10%. It's not real big at the moment. There is a probability that we could zone into uh, base metal rich at depth. So that could change in future updates on resource expansion, but we'll drill that and we'll find out. Yeah, so there's the potential to add more base metals. But I just wanted to clarify that, that those 54 million ounces are just straight silver. And the grade is the other thing people are discussing, Jim. And I think for people that follow Mexican mining or silver mining anywhere, really, anything over 150 grams per ton, which is your cutoff grade, is economic grade. But what would you like to say to the market about having an average of 284 grams per ton silver across the deposit as it's known right now? So that's a fantastic grade, actually. It's about margins or potential margins that you're looking at. So you have to look at what are the that grade and and what kind of widths are you dealing with, and what kind of volume are you dealing with. So you look at our resource. The majority right now is in the D vein, like thirty, almost thirty-one million ounces, and we're getting widths that vary in the D vein from generally like two meters to over 40 meters true width in width incredible on average all the veins together are between five to six meters wide fantastic a lot of the mines in mexico are mining less than a meter and so suffer got really good grades but suffered a lot of dilution so in 150 grams per ton is like a actual mining cutoff in mexico so in your veins 150 to 180 or even lower if you've got wide veins like we do. So using 150 grams is a very realistic cutoff to use when you're you're measuring it. It's like, a, it's like an economic bar, in fact. Okay, th- this is actually a cutoff you'd use in a mining scenario. And those are the ounces above that cutoff. Fantastic. And the continuity on these structures is excellent. The grade continuity along them is incredible. So those things all bode well for the potential economics of the deposit. Yeah, Jim, we were talking off mic, and you know, I think about a lot of the Mexican mines that are mining one and a half to two meter veins, and there is a lot of dilution on either side of those. But if you have a five to six meter average width, that's so much wider that you can actually drop the cutoff grade down some. And you've got a sensitivity table in the project just to give people two different numbers. You know, if you were to drop it down to 120 grams per ton silver, you'd have 60 million ounces of silver. If you were to raise it and be even more conservative to 200 grams per ton silver, you'd still have 43 million ounces of silver. So putting it at 150 seems like the right fit. But maybe talk a little bit more about in a development scenario and your experience, why it's so important to have not just the continuity, but the wider widths, a higher grade average deposit, how this could be setting up for good economics down the road. Yeah, okay. So... The widths are really important because you can mine with bigger mechanized equipment in the same amount of time when you go in and drill and blast the face. You're, if you're blasting something six meters wide as opposed to a meter and a half, which is kind of minimum mining width, 
you're cutting four times the area plus your, the depth of your drilling and you're using mech- bigger equipment, doing it faster in addition to. So you're, you're going to be blasting four to five times the number of tons in the same amount of time. So just think about the cost of unit, but you've got four or five times more units now in the same time frame. So your costs really benefit big time from that. The continuity is really important because the less variability you have, the easier it is to predict and develop a mine plan on and have confidence in that mine plan. So that's another benefit cost-wise. Also, what we didn't mention in the resource news release was the tip of these veins is all very steep. So that's another important thing. In steep veins, you can you have minimal dilution or loss of ore. You can drop it down vertically, blast and drop it down vertically and take it out. If you have a flat vein, like in a coal mine might be underground, you have to leave huge blocks of ore behind to hold the roof up and for stability. So in a room and pillar and a flat ore body, you're losing sometimes 30% of your ore body just for stability. When you have steep veins, like we do, we can't call it an ore body yet until we have an economic study, but when you have steep zones or in a mining scenario, ore, you're going to be pretty much taken at all. And so that's another very positive aspect of this deposit. Yeah, I think there's a lot of things stacking up to show that it probably will be a very economic deposit. Just what you were saying about the width and the stope, you know, being able to blast four times the units. You only have so many shift changes when you're, you know, sending people underground. But if you can get four times the material in the same shift change, it makes a big difference on the economics of a mine. And bringing in the bigger equipment is another huge factor. Also, the continuity that you laid out there, Jim. Now, let's also talk about where this resource is coming from and the work that was done to generate this resource. Let's maybe start first there, Jim. How much has the team drilled to come up with this maiden resource? How many meters went into it? Uh, 53,000 meters, and we have over 200 holes. And I can't remember right offhand how many holes actually went into the resource blocks. But in total, 211 holes and 53,000 meters of drilling. Well, and that's across multiple different veins. So some of those veins and some of the areas you drilled haven't even made it in the resource yet. So let's go there next. The majority of this is coming from the D vein. There's some contributions from the F and from the B and from the I. And there's a couple other areas that made a contribution. But the biggest area of, of influence has been the D vein. Talk about the potential growth there, but also talk about a lot of the holes you put into things like I vein and the B vein that haven't made it in the resource yet. Yeah, so some contribution from those veins in the resource, but not huge. And the B veins, there's a corridor of veins there. There's three of them. And two are in the resource right now. And a lot of strike length to be tested yet on uh, that will hopefully be additive. And the edges of all the resource blocks are not closed off. So we haven't found the limits even in the D vein especially in the D-vein, because we have a a drill hole that shows that the structure and mineralization is going down to double the depth that we've tested so far. So right off the bat, we know we've got tremendous room to grow that one vein. And then talking about the D-vein, because of the the majority of the ounces sit in there, nearly 32 million of the ounces. And on the eastern half of that D-vein, we have very wide spacing. So the shallower drilling, a bunch of that didn't get pulled in because the holes were too far apart. So we have to add holes there, and then we need to go deeper right across the entire length of over 1,200 meters. And so we can see we're going to be expanding potentially very rapidly there. And then these other veins that you're mentioning, pretty lightly drilled on the B veins, those sets of veins there, B and Lupe, and a, a lot a lot of length there, at least doubling the length potential, needs more drill holes. Eye vein, you mentioned that, really lightly drilled, uh, needs a bunch more holes. And there's quite a number of, of veins that don't have holes in them even yet. Well, and even with the B vein, when we've talked before, Jim, you've mentioned that there's 
the B2, but there's also like another parallel structure to that. So maybe even put a little more color around just the B veins and some of the interesting parts where the B vein also looks like it kind of runs into the D vein. Yeah, it does. And so very interesting. In, it is going to intersect. And those areas where two different veins come together can quite often form very large mineralized shoots and bodies. And because you just open up the ground a lot more in those, those places and have a lot more fluid flow. Interestingly, close to where those two veins are projected to intersect, is hole 164 in the D vein that hit 211 grams per ton over 98 meters. Now, the true width was about 48 meters on that. Incredible intercept and almost no drilling around it yet. So there's another real fattened zone in there. And very interesting, it's coming in around where that B vein sets are, are hitting it. So... That's an area, obviously, we're going to go in and systematically drill and, and define. Well, and on the F vein, remind me if I'm not correct on this, Jim, but I think that's where a lot of the historic work was done. That's where some of the historic mining was done, but also that's where a lot of the initial drilling was done by the team. Is there still the potential to expand the F vein more? Yeah, yeah, there is definitely, primarily at depth. So it's left open to depth. There's holes still in 700 gram material at the at the bottom of what we've tested, and there's the two veins on either side of it parallel to it as well. We call hang wall the hang wall veins and the foot wall veins, and so they need to be better understood and better defined at the same time. So all these targets are potential, real good potential for adding more ounces. Well, we don't have to go through the rest of them, but I know we've talked in specific about the I vein before and even the J vein and Lupe. So there's all these other areas that can continue to mass up in this deposit. So it's not by any means closed off yet. It's still very much open. And most of these veins, not just along strike, but also at depth, as you point out. So we'll be looking for the follow-up program as far as the drilling. And it says here in the comments you made in the press release that you're already looking at, your team is already eyeballing another 50,000 meters of drilling at Columba kicking off first with maybe a twenty to 30,000 meter program, I think people will notice that you're in the process of raising capital. Can you tell us about a rough idea of what you think the next phase of the drill program will be and what some of the main targets will be that you go after? So the next twenty to 30,000 meters would focus on finding the limits on that D vein and on the B vein sets and going to depth on F. It's real low-hanging fruit, excellent results, just sitting there to be followed up on, I mean, open-ended mineralization. And that's got real good potential for very significant increase or bump in the, in the resource by doing that. So focused on expansion of those known zones. And then meters beyond that, depending on the results, would either be de dedicated to more drilling on those zones because we haven't found the limits perhaps, or if we have, moving on to a number of those other veins that have good intercepts sitting in them, but you have yet to be followed up. How many veins do you think actually, I mean, not just a straight number, but just give people a sense of the amount of other veins that there is still to follow up besides just the D, the F, and the B? Yeah, so there's there, there are literally dozens of veins. The big principal ones, there's got to be at least uh, seven or eight of them. And then all kinds of smaller parallel things that we see and we see in drilling and cumulatively into kilometers of strike length when you add them together. So that's one measure of when you're looking at these vein districts of what your upside might be. But really, the drill results speak louder than anything. And that's what really counts. And we've gotten just incredible results here. So we've designed, as you mentioned, over 50,000 meters of drilling already on various targets. And with another 50,000 meters, we have the potential to double the size of what we have so far. Results dependent, of course, but that's not a, you know, that's a pretty reasonable probability. Well, and I think that putting this out as a maiden resource but showing the potential for so much other future expansion can give people a flavor of where the Columba project is going. 
And maybe just speak to it in context of the other projects you have. Cumulatively, you have quite a big silver consolidated resource now if you add in all the projects like La Negra, Promotorio, La Cigara. So if you think about the other projects, but Columba in context with those, think about how quickly you've been able to mass up resources here and maybe speak to why this project is a little special because it's not just the high grade, but it's also the width and the continuity. It's a little different of a silver project than the other projects in the stable. Oh, yeah, it is. It's classic vein high grade. The other ones are, are more bulk tonnage disseminated open pit style deposits and lower grade. This is high grade, real big upside. They all have that in similarity, but real big upside, excellent grade. And, you know, grade is what works at any silver price. So very important. And of course, it works even better at a high silver price. But at a silver price of $20, it could even work with grade. So that, that's, um, it's a really uh, exciting and special discovery. Well, and to the point you just made about grade, yes, uh, a higher grade deposit will work even at lower grade silver prices. I think the assumption you use in this model was $26 silver. But Jim, we are at 36 to $37 silver. So when you think about how much silver has moved up recently... If it were to go above 40, let's just say, let's just dream a little bit here. It's not that wild of a, of a summation because it's only about $3 away from where we are today. If silver was to get up into the 40s, what does that mean for not just this Columbo project, but all of the ounces you have? And how many ounces do you have as a company in the ground if you, if you add up all your projects? And what does that mean to the leverage that Kootenai Silver could have to a rising silver price? Yeah, well, it means quite a bit. Every dollar up and the silver price increases the value of what we have and it makes that over forty dollars the three other deposits we have start to look pretty darn interesting and two of them in fact start to look interesting at the current mid-30s so every increase in the silver price is hugely beneficial you know our total ounces silver equivalent well over 300 320 million ounces in all these deposits now yeah, I'm not sure that the valuation you're getting at Kootenai Silver is reflecting the fact that you have 300 million ounces of silver, especially when you think we're pretty close to $37 silver. So just something for people listening in to consider. But just as we wrap up, Jim, when you look at the future of Columba, when you look at the drill program you have ahead of you, are there any other takeaways you want investors to have about the project, about the upcoming program, or any other key catalyst on the horizon that you want people focused in on? Well, really important discovery, tremendous upside to grow this thing. Maiden Resource is excellent. We're really happy about how it came out. And everything we're seeing so far points to real beneficial characteristics of, of this discovery, of this, of this resource that be beneficial in terms of what the potential economics could be. And I say potential because we haven't even done an economic study yet but when you're seeing good wide veins that you know that's positive when you're seeing good continuity that's positive when you got all those ounces above a real mining cutoff grade all very positive stuff well i'm sure there's a lot of news flow on tap for kootenai silver as we follow along with it here at the ke report for those of you listening in, if you want to follow along with the news, definitely click on the link below in the show notes. It takes you right over to the Kootenai Silver website, straight to their news section, where you can follow along. Sounds like there's going to be a lot of drilling on tap and a lot more assays to release in the year to come, so we'll keep following along with that. Jim, keep us posted. We'll get you back on for an update. And as always, looking forward to our next conversation. Great. Thank you, Shad.